Let's take stock of what happened on October the 7th now and the six months following. Joining us is a military expert, an award-winning scholar, professor, author, combat veteran, and national security and military analyst. He served as an advisor to top four-star generals and other senior leaders in the United States and is considered one of the world's leading experts on urban warfare and military strategy. It's a pleasure to have him with us today. John Spencer, thank you so much for being with us. Well, thanks for having me, Michael. Thank you. And of course, it's six months since October the 7th, and you came to Israel and studied that day extensively. There's so much to potentially cover, but how would you describe and characterize what happened on that fateful day? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Is it? It's almost undescribable, and people have tried to use descriptions, and in some ways purposely to belittle or to minimize what happened. And after having walked the grounds, uh, interviewed lots of survivors, police, uh, IDF, it was from every aspect, a military invasion of Israel with the purpose of destroying as much of the nation and as many Jewish civilians as possible. Uh, I describe it as an invasion. Yes, the invaders used terrorist tactics and tried to maximize the the approach the victimization of civilians they purposely targeted 20 different sites most of them civilians they breached the wall they committed massive atrocities of rape mutilations burnings just awful things and then purposely had a guidebook to do it and record it which is a, a uniqueness as well even the you know to be honest, the Nazis, um, the Russians today try to hide their crimes. And in this case, in this invasion, which had full intentions to go as far north as they could and to create as much violence and disrupt the entire Middle East as possible. But they wanted the world to see every act and they wore GoPros and had instructions to wear GoPros and how to fix their GoPros. I think people have already forgotten what happened on that day, and that's a travesty in of itself. Uh, it it doesn't, you know. It's some people try to play with the numbers. That that doesn't really capture. If I say twelve hundred civilians and others were killed on that day by four thousand um, terrorists that crossed the border, that also launched four thousand rockets in a few hours. Um, it's it's intention. It is the methodology. It is the targeting of civilian villages and how they moved to the kibbutzes and secluded them and had a plan to cut off any help so they could go systematically and and massacre as much as, you know, they had guidebooks on how to burn families in their homes, how to roll the tires into their houses so they would die of smoke and also burn. Um it's it's so awful and i'm i'm not even done studying it but it's so hard for to explain to people what happened on that day based on the scale the methodology and really the intent of the invasion and of course media and commentators love a comparison and so we've seen several comparisons out there but is there an equivalent war or conflict to compare this to have you ever seen anything like this so in comparison to the October 7th attack, not in modern times, of course, uh, and the systematic purposely targeting of civilians attempting to burn, you know, you really have to, I mean, it's not only the worst thing to happen to the Jewish people to, since the Holocaust, but you really have to go back to those intentional attacks to wipe out entire villages and, and populations. Now, in the response, which I hope we can talk to as well, there are very few challenges or, or historical examples to the challenge of responding to October 7th, whether that's in the political environment, in the really, uh, unfortunately, because Israel's held to not just a, a double standard, but some type of ridiculous standard in any time they've ever defended themselves. And the fact that they've never started a war, because that's what Hamas did in historical comparison. 
Hamas conducted a war of aggression, an illegal war, on October 7th against the Jewish people. Uh, and in response, Israel declared a war of self-defense in accordance with the UN Charter. But the challenges in which Israel faced are also historic, as in no other military has faced, and we can talk about the specifics, the challenge of the, the military situation to even secure their borders, whether that's to return the hostages, to eliminate Hamas and secure the borders after being attacked. I can't find a historical parallel. One, not because it's Israel and, and it's held to this crazy standard. And it has been, if you look back at the War of Independence, the Six Day War, Yom Kippur War, um, even in self-defense when attacked by overwhelming, when attacked by five armies, it's held to this standard and told to um, not defend itself many times in history. But in the challenge of how do you defend yourself in a world where a lie becomes a truth before the truth is known, in a world where the entire world is watching and criticizing, but they're also watching because of the uniqueness of ubiquitous technologies, they used to call them TikTok wars. I don't know what to call it now. Um, you're fighting, I think it's fighting in a fishbowl where the world is watching, but you can't see through the water. Um, and they're seeing through a soda straw, a glimpse of a moment. And then that moment is taken by you know entire world of anti-Semitic powers to manipulate the world and thinking that something wrong is being done and defending yourself. But by every measure, and we can talk about, you know, what parallels there are in history to what the IDF in defending Israel and trying to bring the hostages home have faced. And there is very few comparison. And I've only found one in military history um, that I can say in modern military history, which is a uniqueness that even comes close, but still fails in comparison to the challenge the IDF faced in the perception of the use of force in the military challenges of facing a combatant force, Hamas, which is, yes, they're terrorists, but they're also a terrorist army for over 15 years that have been given sanctuary and have been the ruling authority in Gaza, developed an immense military capability of over 30,000 fighters and 15,000 plus missiles um, and built a defensive architecture underneath its civilian population of over 400 miles of tunnels ranging from 15 feet to 300 feet underground where no military munition could reach the use of human shields, every aspect, the launching of rockets in the midst of the battle. It's historic. And there's only one comparison, Michael, that I've ever found in military history. And that's the 1945 battle of Manila. If you'd like me to talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. So what, so what are the comparisons there? So the only comparison that I've found to the challenge or the context, really, it's the context, right? So, yes, you can find all kinds of um, historical examples where nobody's following the, the law of war, right? Russia doesn't follow the laws of war. Syria doesn't follow the law of war. It, it, you name it. Uh, they don't follow the laws of war. So it's really hard to find a comparison, right? I can't compare this to Russia and Chechnya. I can't compare this to the Syrian civil war where they use chemical weapons and indiscriminately bomb civilians. And that's a fact. So the only comparison I can find where you have a moral law abiding military, a just military who has a similar context in the combatant they're facing, who also doesn't follow the laws of war is the 1945 battle of Manila where the U S military who follows the law of war and, and has a moral code, ethical code, a professional code, to follow not only the laws of war, but their own moral ethical framework um, that includes a justice system if you don't follow it. The U.S. military in 1945 launched a campaign to retrieve 4,000 prisoners of war and civilians, men, women, and children, being held by the Japanese military in the city of Manila. The city of Manila was about 1.1 million uh, population. The Japanese had besieged it. The Japanese Navy were prepared to defend it to the death with 17,000 
forces um, that had dispersed across the city to defend it. And they were holding these American civilians and British and a couple other countries. And General MacArthur and, and the U.S. administration said, actually famously, go get our people. Hmm. But he also didn't want the city destroyed. So he put m- multiple rule restrictions on the use of force on the American military. So there were 17,000, which, st- which still pales in comparison to the number of Hamas fighters. But there are 17,000 embedded enemy defenders who don't follow the laws of war in the city of Manila. We attacked with about 37,000 American military forces with immense restrictions on the use of force to include no air power because Joe MacArthur did not want Manila destroyed. and It did not want a bunch of Philippine civilians killed. No air power, no unobserved artillery fire, but sent the military to go liberate our people. And in the pursuit of the battle, the Japanese massacred civilians in the midst of the battle, because again, like Hamas, they wanted civilians to die and they wanted to maximize civilian death. But in the end, within a few weeks, the American military liberated our prisoners of war who had been tortured, starved, um, missed, killed, uh, murdered for over, for multiple years, liberated a great majority of them, but in the pursuit of liberating our people, liberating the city and taking it back from the Japanese, 100,000 Philippine civilians died in that battle. But the only context, so that's the only context I can find in historical examples where you have a a law abiding military attacking a, a person who uses, who conducts war crimes, defending the use of tunnels, although the Japanese had had the sewer system and they created tunnels and integrated that that increased the complexity of how to get to them but this is the only comparison and the result was tragic um but it, it incorporates many of the complexities and the context of what the idea faced but the world there wasn't cell phones in manila there wasn't in a belief that no matter what the Americans do or say, they're lying. It doesn't matter. You're lying. I don't care. I believe the 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 war criminals who are in using war crimes as a method of warfare. I believe them over you. There there wasn't that in Manila. Hmm. And of course you've indicated that civilian casualties in this conflict in Gaza compared with the uh, amount of terrorists that are being taken out are comparatively low. Can you elaborate on that a bit? Sure. Um, for some reason, um, people in this war, unlike any war in the history of war, are are s- develop some type of quantitative effects based condemnation, as in how many civilians have died compared to the combatants, irrelevant of the context of what the Hamas combatant is doing. The fact that it built there is no military site. There is no Hamas military identifiable site in Gaza because Hamas puts its entire military industrial architecture under civilians, under civilian homes, under schools, under hospitals, in hospitals. But everybody wanted to use the numbers of civilian to combatant ratio to say, look, this is an unjust war. When in fact, it, what I, the IDF have done is executed a just war justly and kept the civilian casualties by taking immense disadvantages in the military approach, kept the civilian collateral damage, the civilian casualties to a historically low number in general, and especially a historically low number in urban combat, which is very unique to other forms of combat where there isn't an immense amount of civilian populations present that you need to move out of harm's way or in the war quickly to where the enemy's tactics of trying to get enemy or civilians killed isn't work. So yes, in Israel, in Gaza, the IDF have been able to eliminate the, uh, the Hamas fighters at a historically fast pace while keeping civilian casualties to a low pace. But the problem is that no matter what the number is, the world doesn't care. Hmm. The world believes, again, a Hamas terrorist organization's civilian numbers. So if you 
this is the pursuit of some moral justification um, despite all evidence of what the IDF are actually doing on the ground, how they have targeted Hamas, how they have moved forward and cleared urban terrain and taken all legal obligations and every precaution that's ever been in invented in urban combat and then created new ones that nobody has seen in the history of war and then still kept the number to low, so low um, to include in the highest intensity, which was the beginning, now six months later to a historically low number that there's no credit being given to the approach that is being done now. And people are using data from six months ago and saying, look, the, the too many civilians are dying to no, despite the fact that the number that's being used includes every civilian death in Gaza over the last six months, what, no matter who did it, um, it includes every Hamas combatant. So according to the number that the world which is really the problematic place to include global leaders quote now we're recording really three months into it without putting caveats it includes every hamas combatant that has died in gaza according to the world that hamas combatant is an innocent civilian and of course while limiting civilian casualties you mentioned putting themselves at a disadvantage we've seen over 600 idf deaths uh, as a result during this war. And so let's think back to the aims originally set. We know about the hostages, of course, but in terms of degrading and destroying Hamas, how would you assess the IDF's progress? So based on multiple visits now to the IDF, to include in Khan Yunus, the IDF have effectively, rapidly destroyed Hamas which is one of the goals. They've also brought half the, the hostages home through military pressure. But by a military metrics, the IDF have successfully cleared a majority of, and there's only a, a small portion as, as we're talking, left for the IDF to clear. They have destroyed Hamas's military capability, as in by the number of coherent military organizations. So as of Today, they've destroyed 19 of 24 of the infantry battalions or the, the, the coherent battalions of Hamas, and it still has you know, rocket forces and things like that. They have reduced the number of rockets that the Hamas militants can fire at Israel's civilian sites, every single one of them a war crime. So over 12,000 war crimes uh, reduced them to, on some days, zero that can be fired. But just by the metric of clearing the urban terrain that Hamas controlled by destroying Hamas's military capability to where it has a very small fraction, the IDF have moved at a historic pace because it, by comparison to other modern battles, in the context of the defender, they have taken the enemy, Hamas's terrain away from them, cleared the enemy fighters off the battlefield to where they have only a very small fraction of military forces left and done it at a historically low number of civilian casualties to do that effective campaign against Hamas. You can talk again, every metric clearing tunnels, destroying Hamas's strategic tunnels, uh, clearing the, the urban terrain by every metric. The IDF have been successful at destroying the Hamas military's capability and taking it away from them to the point of achieving an ultimate victory, which is in war is really hard to define, but in this war, it's actually very definable. And so we've spoken about some of the misreporting. What do you view as the key piece of context that is often overlooked or downplayed or skewed regarding the events of October the 7th and the subsequent war in Gaza? Yeah, so unfortunately, I, I had to watch the misinformation happen. And usually misinformation has a kernel of truth. Uh, and in some aspects, everything that's been said about Israel at this point, there isn't even a kernel of truth in it. I, I like the fact that the IDF have attacked hospitals. Uh, the IDF have moved forward and secured every hospital in Gaza, removed the Hamas terrorists that were using it for military purposes and then returned it to operating capability and 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 aided 
the civilian population and returning it to it. So not a single hospital in Gaza has been bombed, attacked, but every one of them have had Hamas militants using them for military purposes. So every one of them have been searched. And oh, by the way, there's also six field hospitals that the IDF have facilitated being stood up to increase the capability of just that one essential service, which is care for civilians in hospitals. But every aspect from October 7th, you know, the misinformation that Hamas didn't target as civilians. It, it was incidental civilian you know, deaths. When by every reasonable bit of evidence, Hamas targeted and cut off civilian cities like Sarot and Afikum and villages like Faraza and, and Barry. And, uh, they targeted them, surrounded them, cut them off from support and massacred the civilians. By every measure, everything that anybody knows, the majority, is wrong about this war. And it's really the silent majority versus the loud minority who have prevailed for many reasons to warp the world's perception of what has gone on on October 7th and every day since. I mean, the fact that Hezbollah attacked on October 8th and nobody covers the immense attack that Hezbollah has conducted against Israel and opened the second front on October 8th and the fact that 100,000 civilians. I mean, this really, Michael, gets to the question of if it wasn't Israel, how would this war have gone? If it was America, how, what would we do? If six months into the war, there were 100,000 Americans who couldn't return to their home because of threat of a very clear, present, real, daily threat of attack on those on your homes. I can tell you with strong confidence that this war would have gone a lot differently had this been America who was attacked, um, attacked at that scale, invaded, sovereign borders invaded, massacring of civilians, thousands of rockets being launched at our cities. I can tell you with strong confidence that the United States military, through, based on direction of the administration, would respond with overwhelming force to bring our civilians home, to make the stop rockets stop raining down, and to remove that imminent threat from our border with overwhelming force. And of course, it's not America, it's Israel. So Israel fights effectively, morally, but partially hamstrung because of the things that you mentioned, the international response and the curbs that are put on it. So why is the outcome of this war important to the United States and to the West? Yeah, that's a great question. Again, this is what is not making the news. Um, this is what has not made the news since October 7th that what Hamas and its Iranian masters did on October 7th was not just horrible by every metric, it was the attempt to rewrite the strategy of the Middle East and really of global terrorism. Develop a sanctuary in which you make it so hard for even a moral just American, Israeli, anybody to attack that they won't do it. If Hamas survives the war, the world is a much more violent place because Hamas will have implemented a strategy to attack Israel and by, and, and by purpose, American interests and American values. And it will show the world that it is possible to attack not just Israel, and pursue a grand strategy to destroy Israel as a nation and all Jewish people. That's their strategy. And, and it's interesting that nobody will listen to what Hamas says and writes down. But if Hamas survives this, they will have achieved an immense victory and become you know, great perceptions and political power that you can strike at the West, basically, at American interests, uh, at democracy, and you can survive it and you can implement this plan. And we would see October 7th style attacks happening multiple more times. One that Moss says isn't what they want to do, but the strategy will have been validated that you can attack in a hot October 7th style attack 
violate all the laws of war and international law and achieve an immense political gain. And that you can use proxies like Iran. So Iran, who also wants to destroy Israel and wants to destroy the United States, will have validated a strategy of using proxies to attack a force and achieve an immense political gain and weaken the world in, in essential. So I think it's of immense U.S. interest that Israel prevails in this war so that Israel is safe, the only democracy in, in the Middle East, and so that all countries are the same, and that the global international order of what can and can't be done in wars maintains. But this is, there are so many echelons of why Hamas in Iran cannot have October 7th be some celebrated victory that can be replicated again. By every nature of even deterrence of freedom of good versus evil, Hamas cannot achieve victory, period. And of course, so much misinformation we discussed it. Social media is very prevalent with, you know, misinformation when it comes to this conflict. And so boil it down for us, just a final message for our audience and perhaps even the TikTok generation. Uh, with everything we've seen from October the 7th and the ongoing conflict, uh, what's your message to the global audience watching about how they should see things uh, that are unfolding in Gaza? The biggest message to the outside world is everything that has made the news or the perception of what has gone on on October 7th and every day since, and especially in Israel's response to Hamas, is wrong. Israel has conducted a just war of self-defense and executed it justly in accordance with every law of armed conflict and every moral sense of moving forward to destroy an evil in Hamas while protecting civilians while aiding civilians, while doing everything reasonable, feasible, even imaginable to protect civilians in Gaza while moving forward to remove the evil of Hamas and destroy its military capability so that the, not just Israel is, is better, but so that Gaza is better because the only hurdle to preventing civilian harm. The only hurdle to aiding the Palestinian people in Gaza is Hamas. John Spencer, we very much appreciate your analysis and your voice at this critical time. We thank you for your service to your country, um, to all that you do, and thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Michael. Don't forget, if you enjoy our live shows and want to be kept up to speed with all that's happening in Israel, be sure to click the subscribe button on YouTube.